Thank you. you have to kind of look. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to have to look up there. Wow, no microphone or anything. Um, thank you so much, um, all of you guys, for waking up so early. Good morning. Um, thank you, Ms. Pines, for putting this together. This is such an amazing thing you've created. I love that it's metastasizing all over the world now. Um, Thanks to all the sponsors, obviously, too, and I'll say especially thank you to Zeba, who I'm, I'm grateful to Zeba not only for today's strange event, um, but also for helping to keep me alive a few years ago as a freelance copywriter. Um, one of the stranger jobs I've ever had was at Zeba back when Zeba was at a different location. Um, this was uh, back during the bubble years, you might remember, um, when you could, like, paint in your house and it would automatically double in value. Um, <laughs> this was uh, um, real estate developers around the region, I guess, were just so, so much money was sloshing around in their bank accounts that they were hiring uh, fancy design firms to uh, brand their new properties. I don't know if this still exists or not. Maybe, I assume this was just like a strange uh, outgrowth of that irrational exuberance. but. Um, uh, so, you know, they're hiring uh, copywriters to more or less uh, just imbue their properties with this automatic history and romance and give them backstories. And um, I was hired to name a golf course, um, <laughs> which was actually an amazing job and was super interesting. And the people were great. Uh, the research was interesting. Um, and for a writer, that's just like an awesome gig, you know? I mean, you're like, what are you working on? Oh, I'm writing the map, you know? I'm going to open up a map. Yeah, I wrote those streets. I wrote that stuff right there. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Um, and, um, and it was actually sort of doubly or triply great, too, because, um, well, in, in that time, I, uh, I learned one of the main maxims of, of naming real estate, which is that you name a thing after the thing that you're destroying to make it. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, you have, that's how you get your uh, meadow lane or your, uh, you know, Live Oaks Retirement Community or something. Um, Sioux Falls, I don't know if you realize the name Sioux Falls, that city is actually, there are no waterfalls in Sioux Falls, that actually is where the Sioux Nation was destroyed, um, which is, you know, a more grim sort of thing. Um, but in doing that research, what was so amazing is that I, you know, I wanted to see it was getting ground up to make this golf course, and so I did, uh, some research into local history, and I came across a really interesting uh, story about the early Oregon Trail, about a lost wagon train um, wandering around in the desert, um, which kind of stuck with me, and it was just you know a collateral side effect of doing this job. And uh, I ended up writing a screenplay based on that that became the movie Meek's Cutoff. So in many ways, Zeba is responsible for an art movie starring Michelle Williams. Um, and um, so, as, uh, as that story might kind of indicate, I've been a very, a very lucky guy the last 10 years or so. Um, um, I've had, yeah, lots of strange, interesting opportunities leading to opportunities. I've been able to write a few books and have a hand in a variety of movies and have a couple kids. Um, it's been a good, productive, creative time. <laughs> <coughs> and um, so, uh, in thinking about today's theme of happiness, um, I, um, well, I, I, I realized that to me, the idea of talking about happiness, um, I have a sort of aversion to it on some level. I feel like in my mind, one just doesn't 
You don't speak about your happiness unless you are really asking for a smiting of some kind. Um, <laughs> that there's like no sure way of bringing wrath and destruction on yourself than bragging about how happy you are. <laughs> and that might be like a biblical thing or just general literary thing, but I, I don't want to go there for my own personal reasons. And I feel like also just as a, as a room full of, you know, creative people, um, it's more interesting in a way to talk about uh, creative dissatisfaction and unhappiness than creative happiness. Like if something is working, it's working. You don't need to talk about it. Um, it's when things aren't working so well that, uh, that talking needs to happen. And so I'm going to um, talk not so much about the last 10 years, which have been generally fine, um, but I'm going to talk about the 10 years previous to that, the 90s, my 20s, um, where things were not working so well. And I'm going to give you a little tour of some of the dead ends that I was coming to at that point and that hopefully will lead to better things. Um, also, just as a quick aside, <coughs> this is just the perfect audience to tell this to, a creative audience at a Creative Mornings event. Um, have any of you read that book, uh, Then We Came to the End by Josh Ferris? It's a novel, it's such a good book. Um, it was a National Book Award nominee a few years ago, and it's about, uh, it's about like an advertising firm going through uh, downsizing, um, and it, kind of takes this collective uh, um, voice of the whole ad agency. But there's a really funny part in it where it talks about just the word creative and how within the creative industry that word has become like every ki kind of speech, like the people who make the creative are creatives and the stuff they make is the creative. And then it still has the sort of old meanings of just like, that's a creative thing to do. Um, and so conceivably, one could write an entire sentence only using the word creative, which is kind of incredible. You know, creative creatives creating creative creative. <laughs> I find that hilarious. <coughs> um, so anyway, um, I'm going to um, start with, uh, well, okay. So anyway, uh, back in the back in the day. I, um, I uh, grew up around here and I um, uh, went away to college at a certain point and I came back in 1994 um, with the idea of having a creative life. Um, I mean some of you might know the show Portlandia and the whole dream of the 90s alive in Portland kind of thing. Uh, I feel like I definitely was here for that dream um, still live it in some ways. Um, and um, it was, uh, you know, it was an interesting uh, time for myself. There's lots of uh, interesting people around and good parties. At least one or two of those people are here today that I was hanging out with then. Um, and I'm sure for some people, you know, like Kay Brownstein and others, uh, the 90s was really dreamy. You know, they were making really amazing work and having very amazing creative lives. For myself, it was not so dreamy because the stuff I was making was not very good and not doing what I wanted it to do. Um, and, um, you know, I had come back to town uh, from college uh, with lots of um, kind of abstruse and grandiose plans about all the different forms of creativity I was going to indulge in and become successful at. Um, and I don't know, yeah, how many, I assume, I don't know what, what you guys all learned in college if you went to college, but for me, uh, the, the real big uh, um, lessons I was learning were in the realm of theory or uh, post-structuralist, uh, yeah, post-structuralism, basically. I was one of those people who really loved literary criticism, loved uh, everything to do with identity theory, loved the whole vocabulary of you know, hegemony and power and all that kind of stuff. And um, one, of the, one of the kind of main ideas of that body of knowledge was just was the idea of the death of the author, uh, Roland Barthes' idea of the death of the author, um, and the rise of the critic or the rise of the um, reader. And this had kind of political ideas, like just the idea of within the idea of authorship was some form of authority. This is like a May 68 kind of idea, like a very radical 
sort of cerebral politics that, um, you know, by being an author, you're somehow imposing your own uh, interpretations onto the world, your own meanings. And the more politically advanced kind of position to take is that of the critic or the reader, and you're act and wherein you're more dissolving uh, pre-existing meanings and um, problematizing the meanings that are leading to um, the oppression that exists in the world. I was, I was delighted by these ideas. And um, in some ways, that delight, or that sort of sensibility, I think, is viewable even in my earliest work. Um, <laughs> this is the first book that I ever made when I was about six. And you can see John R's book, it says. <coughs> and it's what I think is a cop. Um, you can see that little kind of sheriff badge on his chest right there and a cop hat. It was only a one-page book. That's the cover. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for anyone who knows anything about Althusser's theory of the interpolation of the subject in capitalism, this is clearly about that. It's a cop yelling, fuck you, at a pedestrian crossing against the stopwalk to get to the pizza place, you know? <laughs> um, that is like some serious, serious theorizing going on, <laughs> as I recall. Um, but anyway, so strangely, the, the first project that I engaged in after college, um, it doesn't look exactly like that first book, but in some ways the, the ethos is similar. Um, it was a book of uh, essays about a fictitious artist. Um, and for me it was, uh, I mean, very much running off the fumes of college. I just loved those, uh, you know, um, uh, academic journals like October or representations. I don't know if people are into the, or were ever into those things, but um, this was more or less my facsimile of one of those things, but with this kind of empty spot in the middle. So it's like a series of academic essays about a non-existent artist um, arguing about issues of race and class and gender and avant-gardism um, in ways that I was hoping were radical and, and sort of canceled each other out in some ways. And, um, you know, uh, I was in some ways, uh, um, there's like the list of, yeah, stuff there. Uh, as a, as a kind of object, I'm still like okay with it. Like I was lucky enough to have a lot of friends who worked at Kinko's at that time and I was able to get just massive amounts of free copying and do these like cool gatefold uh, color plates inside and, um, uh, and even get like a, there's the contributors list, um, and even get like a little perfect binding on it. Um, but if one is to actually read the pages, uh, like, there's a real curdling feeling that happens because it is fundamentally, like, unreadable text. It is, like, it is not, not interesting in any kind of way, and it actually barely makes sense in any way. <coughs> um, and, you know, thankfully my, my expectations were not incredibly high with this thing, and so the, the sort of success of this was I sent out a handful of them to various academics that I admired, and I got a postcard back from one of my favorite art historians, Lucy Lepard, um, giving me the thumbs up, and so that, you know, it felt like it was a successful foray into something. Um, and, and, you know, over time, as I kind of drag it out and look at it from time to time, I do still find structurally there to be something, like, intriguing about it. I mean, I do like the idea of this sort of empty box um, and the, you know, I think on paper it sounds like a good idea, and I think that you'll see a sort of a recurring thing with these projects that <clears throat> on paper they sound good, but then in the execution they just sort of fall flat. Um, so after, this took me, this took me like a year or two to really assemble, and when I was done with this, uh, I was kind of left wondering what to do next, and Part of the dream of the 90s uh, was uh, multidisciplinarity, I think. Um, there's this idea that many of the tools of making things were becoming available to everyone with, you know, laptop publishing and cheap video uh, cameras and stuff. And I think uh, 
it was easy to imagine that one could kind of try one's hand at many different things. And so for me, that ended up resolving into three main uh, streams of endeavor, um, one of which was kind of curating and art writing, one of which was painting, and one of which was video. And I'm just going to give you a quick little tour of that stuff. Um, the, uh, um, the curating that I was doing, I guess I was under the impression as a young person, too, that part of the job of being an artist um, was to party. <coughs> um, <laughs> and that like, there's a sort of just bohemian tradition of like social scene making. And so I think for myself, part of the pleasure of like organizing art shows was trying to create social situations under the umbrella of, of art. And, um, and on that level, I think these, these events were reasonably successful. Um, I also, it's also hard for me to remember, but at that time I was very anti-rock. Like I, all, so many of my friends were musicians that I felt like someone had to do something else. And so part of my plan with this was just forcing people to make something that didn't involve guitars. And um, it was this sort of despotic urge of mine to, you know, change people's creative path, um, which ended up, I think that was part of why a lot of the work that got made was a little bit half-assed, because no one really cared that much. It was like they would rather be doing what they enjoyed. Um, <laughs> and I came to learn that eventually. Again, like, there's something I do kind of like about these objects. Like, I thought this was a cool idea. Like, we put the little set um, uh, lettering on the TV and then took photographs of that so that every, every like, copy got a different it was sort of dependent on what, whatever was on TV became the cover of this thing. Um, and so with this, in this one, we made everyone uh, do little videos and, uh, yeah, created these little, um, these little booklets. Here's another one that we did. I like the, I like the objects, but, again, the writing, the writing is, is arcane to the point of, of unintelligible. Um, this is one of the posters for one of the shows. Um, so partly just as a way of filling the like, space inside of a show, and also partly because I do really like painting, I uh, began doing some painting myself. Um, and uh, the sort of format that I chose was these like uh, four by eight pieces of plywood, and then I would go and get uh, paint from Fred Meyer, and I would... Um, paint a sort of mural in my basement that then I would go and put up on a wall somewhere, um, sort of unbeknownst to whoever owned the wall. And um, <laughs> like, you know, one of the more, one of the better ones was one I put on to, I painted a big Skipper's logo, if you know Skipper's, that restaurant, <laughs> um, with like a big fist with a trident in it and like bloody <laughs> fish all over and I like, I went and nailed it to the wall of Skipper's. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that lasted for a few minutes. Um, <laughs> this, was, this was probably my most ambitious painting project, this obelisk that I built um, over in Paranoia Park. I don't know if you guys know. You guys have probably walked through this park before. Um, Gus Van Sant made that Paranoia Park movie, but he kind of relocated it to the skate park. But this was really Paranoia Park. Um, and um, my idea with this... Um, it's something that, it's an ongoing interest of mine. Um, an attempt to splice like the iconography of New Age spirituality, like dolphins and rainbows, um, <laughs> with, um, with more like an Old Testament kind of ambiance, um, <laughs> like <coughs> lightning and, and Hebrew lettering, um, <laughs> and skeletons. <laughs> And um, uh, here's the color. Now you can see what it really looked like. Um, I was kind of limited to what was available at Fred Meyer discount <laughs> bin. Um, and um, so, you know, there were... P part of my interest here, too, was, was also theoretical. Like, I, I would tell myself and I would tell people that this was an investigation of public space, that I was interested in somehow intervening on public space and testing the kind of nature of, of you know, how truly public is public space. And I, it was, I realized 
in retrospect, that it was this kind of combination of bravado and insecurity at the same time of like not wanting entirely to take uh, credit for the the uh, the meaning of the work, but more like just the placement of the work. Like, don't look at what this is; just look where it is, you know. Um, and and it was sort of a way of inoculating myself from too much um, too much vulnerability, I think. Um, because, I mean, certainly for my, to talk about the, the emotional side of this work, which in my mind did have to do with certain sadness about lost friends and things like that, that was impossible for me to do at that time to talk about this stuff in any sort of emotional form. And it, it kind of had to come armored in this, um, in this theoretical sort of, uh, not so much jargon, but just, yeah, well, yeah, a jargon of some kind. Um, uh, it's also strange to me to think how much effort I put into these things that literally lasted like hours. I mean, this thing was, I, I spent weeks making this and within five hours, homeless kids had destroyed the whole thing. <laughs> um, but, um, oh, so this is, th the thing that also I was not quite realizing at the time was how much of my effort in, in either putting on these little shows or uh, making the art, um, how much of that was really just a way of creating a kind of host body for the writing that I was really wanting to do. I would write these incredibly elaborate press releases for the things that I was doing that were basically like the entire article I wanted someone to publish <laughs> and then just sending it out to whatever, you know, <laughs> whatever journalist I thought might do it. Um, yeah, don't read any of that stuff. It's really <laughs> ridiculous. I'm just sort of, it's more about just the volume of words I was generating to um, explain myself. Um, but um, the, um, so yeah, so anyway, this theory of, of like, I mean, it's funny, it, it seems self-evident that if you're making art, you're putting it into the public sphere that, I mean, part of making art is, actually, I don't want anyone to read this. I need to put this somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I see people reading, and it's like, I don't want that to happen. <laughs> um, part of the, um, uh, I mean, yeah, inherent in making art is to put it into public view, and that was, uh, you know, something that I felt the need to really thematize, even though it was, um, yeah, basically self-evident. One of the major avenues I had for um, my theories of putting things into public uh, was cable access uh, television which I found to be like a, a politically and theoretically amazing institution. And I actually, I still do. The idea that you could make something and then have it forcibly piped into people's living rooms um, <laughs> was uh, like, just seemed like so many amazing opportunities. And so I spent um, a lot of time making like really strange videos, just hoping that they would show up on someone's um, screen in the middle of the night. Um, probably the most, probably the best one I did, which I won't show you right now, was called Battles on the Astral Plane, and it was uh, myself, uh, it, it was kind of a riff on that uh, game Mortal Kombat, um, if you know that game where people fight each other, and I dressed up like different characters and would fight against myself, um, and it was the sort of round robin, and eventually someone won, and um, that might have been the only one that like gave people any pleasure. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, major, the major project of my, of my 20s um, was a, a feature-length video that I made called Croc. Um, let's see. What do we have? Yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, I know there's, a, there's at least two people who are around for this era. Um, it was a, it was a feature-length live-action video based on the comic strip Croc, if anyone remembers that <laughs> daily comic strip. <laughs> at least someone remembers it. <laughs> um, even at that time, it was, like, to me, an interestingly, like, vestigial script, like it already, it, or a vestigial strip, like it felt already archaic and strange, like it, it's this kind of borscht belty, uh, like, punchline kind of uh, uh, strip that is part of a larger family of strips that might include ones you know like uh, BC, if you know BC, that's like the caveman strip, or uh, Wizard of Id, that's like the like 
feudalistic medieval strip. So Croc was probably the least well-known of all those. It was the French Foreign Legion version of that. And so for reasons like, again, sort of political, like I like the kind of you know, post-colonial element of it. Um, and then, I mean, th there are a lot of influences going into making this seem like a good idea at the time. Um, I was really interested in like appropriation art, people like, uh, you know, Sherry Levine or uh, um, uh, uh, Cindy Sherman, you know, people who would, that, of that pictures generation that could take an image from, a pre from the pre-existing uh, media and kind of by reinterpreting it, like turn it into their own art. Like I found that to be an interesting idea. And, um, you know, the idea of taking a strip and actually using the language from that strip. I mean, actually, a lot of the dialogue is straight from the comic strip. On paper, that sounded like an interesting idea. Um, also, this was a time of, like, the abject artists who I really liked as well, uh, Mike Kelly, uh, Paul McCarthy, um, people who uh, rejected any idea of, like, virtuosity and were interested in making things that were on the surface very cruddy, but were intellectually um, acute in some ways. Um, I also was really loving the films of like John Waters. I just found that to be a very liberating kind of model of filmmaking. Uh, Paul Morrissey, if you know him, he's the, he was, uh, his movies were produced by Andy Warhol. Um, I just had it in my mind that like, and there's also this part of me that had it in my mind that like no matter what crappy thing I did, or we all did, like just by pointing a camera at my friends at the time who I found to be all incredibly amazing people, something amazing would happen. And, um, and in a sense that is true, I mean as a, as a kind of yearbook, this remains an interesting um, document, but as a, as a film experience, it is um, quite terrible. And so we will watch, uh, let's watch just a few little seconds of it, just so you can see what it is. We're just gonna skip through because to watch the entirety is too long. These are the opening credits that go on for 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> <coughs> and that basically was, uh, this is the strip, so you can kind of get it into your mind. This is what the actual strip looked like. And that's cornmeal on the top of it with a hair dryer um, blowing it off like sand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally, these, <laughs> it's, like, I could rationalize it as some sort of modernist device, like, we're just really punishing the audience for a while before it gets good, you know? <laughs> um, I still like the images of the strip. Um, okay, we can, we can skip along to the next stuff. You know, so, yeah, here are, like, people in the desert walking around. There's always this lost patrol. Uh, part, part of the strip was, there's, like, a despotic tyrant named Vermin Croc. And then there's, like, this lost patrol that walks around in the desert. <clears throat> so, yeah, let's, let's keep things moving. We don't want to get stuck anywhere. Oh yeah, here's the tent scene. Um. <laughs> yeah, of course, right, yeah. <laughs> also, I will say the music uh, was really good. The soundtrack to Croc by the band Bug Skull, um, it actually became its own album, and that is, a, no kidding, a really amazing album. Um, the musicians at that time were incredibly talented. Uh, okay, let's keep going, keep going. I mean, really, we're kind of, you get the idea. Um, it just, yeah, gets crazier and stupider. Um, <laughs> Jean Cocteau ripoff right here. <coughs> yeah, okay. I, here, just show the last little batch for a second and you'll get the idea. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. 
It's this kind of thing. Okay, let's turn it off. <laughs> there was a, <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, like on paper it sounds good. I mean, this movie has like five dream sequences in a row. That sounds awesome. <laughs> um, it has like obligatory transgressive things like I literally shit an egg on camera in this thing. Um, that's like, and yet at the same time, like it has these kind of transgressive things, but it ultimately always, when I watch it now, just feels really prude and uptight. Like there's something so forced about the whole thing. Um, but at the time I was just, I mean, it was just this weird mania that I was feeling. Like among the only people I've ever yelled at in my life is my friend Dan, who um, had promised to release Croc uh, through his record label and was kind of dawdling in doing that for like a few months. And I remember just like yelling at Dan, like, when are you gonna put it out? Like, when's it gonna go? Like, cause I had in my mind that like somewhere else in the country, someone else had made Croc also. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, just gonna get it out before me. And it was like, um, I mean, it was just like this, ins like if it was just, was it, if that's what it was, that would have been fine. But I had these really strange ideas of how it was gonna like affect the world. And it was just a really disappointing and terrible experience to have the world premiere at the Clinton Street Theater and have all my friends show up in funny clothes and to be sitting there watching it in that room and just to feel the palpable boredom and disinterest and kind of <laughs> disappointment that people had. And like, it was really, I mean, it truly scarred me for years. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And, um, and, um, I mean, it's funny too, because there's been a sort of funny afterlife to it. Like as you get older, uh, your friends assume positions of power. And at this point, I have friends at PICA. So like three years ago, um, Croc ended up in the TBA festival um, as for like a 13 year anniversary screening. <laughs> and it showed at the museum. And there's this part of me that's like, maybe, you know, maybe it was better than I remember. Maybe it was like just ahead of its time, you know, like it's, like Kim Chi, you know, you had to sort of bury it for a while and then it's like <laughs> ripened, you know, like the world is finally ready. And like sitting in that theater again, it was just like, no, it's just, it's just horrible. And like I walked into the bathroom at one point and some guy was in there being like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I was like, it's true, it's horrible. <laughs> um, and, um, so yeah, I mean, and so there was, for me, like a long hangover from that where I was like, you know, I've tried, I don't know exactly what I'm doing, but the, the kind of nadir of my 90s for myself came um, maybe a year or two after that even at the Hollywood Theater for a different uh, video screening. And um, at this point, like the video stuff that I was making had really like become much more desiccated and kind of unambitious and I was, um, this was like a video slash music screening there and I was projecting some footage that I had shot behind uh, some musician friends and it was, um, I mean, it was just, uh, yeah, I, it, it had become very photographic. It was just like, here's like an image of a little daisy shivering in the wind or here's like a tree or here's like a, some traffic going by. Like it was very emptied out of any, any kind of meaning. Um, and, you know, it was nice, it was fine, it looked no worse than a lot of other things um, up on the screen that night, I'm sure. But um, also that night was um, the premiere of my friend Miranda July's, uh, it, it was her first sort of premiere of what would become her first major uh, um, performance piece called Love Diamond. And, um, for people, like, to, to be sort of a young artist with someone like Miranda is at once like an exhilarating and demoralizing experience for everyone around them. Um, it's an amazing thing to see someone really assembling their vocabulary at a young point and, um, and, and just channeling things that you have no idea where they came from. It's like, wow, how did she do that this time? And so, you know, I'd been lucky enough to watch some of this happening over the previous years. And this was the point where a lot of it was really coming together and she was doing this, just this amazing storytelling with you know, sound effects and strange encounters and like gothic uh, 
feelings, and it was, um, it was just so much more like deep and elaborate and intense than the dinky bullshit that I had going on at the same time. And um, I just remember walking out of that particular screening being like, I don't know what, I'm like, I, I can't do this stuff anymore. It's just not, not working in any kind of way. Um, and I realized, you know, part of what I was responding to in Miranda's work was the storytelling and her just real embrace of, of authorship and of like, yeah, imposing a great story on an audience and like entertaining an audience and trying to seduce an audience and just like all the things that had initially ever drawn me to wanting to make art, you know? I mean, I was a reader as a, a, a big reader as a kid and um, it wasn't like, writing against writing or theorizing about writing that had turned me on to writing. It was actual novels and stories and like um, things that, in, that I found absorbing and that I would give myself over to for a time and live in some totally other dream world. And it was at this point that I, uh, I think I really dramatically had to start unlearning a lot of the received notions that I had built up over the years about, you know, what advanced art should look like or what, uh, um, what, what the function of art was like. And I, I started thinking of it much more in terms of, you know, the art that you're making is kind of a gift that you're giving to other people and that they should like and they, they should take pleasure in and you're not trying to like teach them something or force them to do something, but you're trying to like on some level uh, entertain them or, or, or um, solace them. And um, that began the point where I just said, fuck it, I'm not doing video or painting or any of that shit. I'm just going to write fiction and see what happens. And over the years, I then ended up writing a novel called The Half-Life that, um, that, you know, coincidentally involved young amateur filmmaking and um, imprisoned intellectuals like in Croc and Skeletons. Um, like it turned out a lot of the stuff I'd been doing in my 20s ended up being the kind of mulch for this other more involved project. And a project that like, you know, it mattered to me like what happened with it, but I was sufficiently engrossed in just the sentence writing and in making the paragraphs that I could forget about a lot of the problems that I was facing or even the expectations I had for the work and I was willing to just kind of submit to the craft of the language like as it turned out you know so many of those other things I was doing were just like this slog I was going through in order to be able to do the writing about it either before or afterwards and now it's like I'm just going to do the writing and I'm going to treat it as a as a kind of craft and I'm going to try and be as good at it as I can um, knowing I'll never exhaust language, I'll never exhaust all the possibilities of, of storytelling or, or uh, describing things, um, but I can kind of just enter it as some sort of perpetual amateur and acolyte and enjoy the absorption that it gives me. And, um, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, like that book I felt like was the first thing that I really did that um, that other people did in some level respond to and that like got to people in a certain way. And then I think in the, in the kind of magical way that a creative life can happen, um, that book uh, was read by my friend Kelly Reichert, who's a filmmaker who has kind of invited me into her filmmaking process and we've ended up working on four movies together at this point. Um, and that led also to working with my friend Todd Haynes on a, um, on a mini-series type project. And so, in a strange way, the, the fiction has sort of opened up the world of still making moving images in a certain sense, um, but in a different way, like, you know, by kind of committing to something, like all the opportunities have kind of remained on the table in a very lucky and enchanted kind of way. And so, I guess, like, as far, and I guess so my, my sort of lesson or moral of that as far as our theme of happiness is that um, for me, um, 
happiness really is about just giving up <coughs> um, and like submitting to something that uh, is, uh, yeah, and just sort of, yeah, submitting to something larger. And like the more, the more you can give up, the better as long as you continue doing it at the same time. And like, you know, I, I foresee that I'm gonna have to give up certain things in the future and I'm hoping, you know, to have the nerve to continue doing it in a kind of different way. And I think that for me that is the, I'm kind of, I'm kind of staking a lot of my life on the idea that like if I can just continue giving up in as aggressive a way as possible, like other doors will open um, and lead me into some new kind of territory. So um, that's sort of my talk for today. Um, I'd be happy to talk about this stuff or also the world that came after this stuff, you know, books and films, um, if anyone has any questions about that stuff. And uh, again, thank you guys so much for coming out. Are there any questions? Yeah. You use the term mold to describe sort of this body of work that you sort of keep mm -hmm. in passion. Uh, do you find that uh, because you can't think of something new, you're <laughs> sort of enamored with that subject matter? I think, um, I think that like everyone does end up having certain patterns, you know? I mean, I think there end up being these uh, particular figures or um, tropes that uh, for whatever reason are kind of uh, magnetizing to a person. And I think, yeah, partly it's a lack of imagination, um, but it's also, um, I think one does, at least for myself, like I'm, I'm interested in the idea of like sort of gradually mutating or evolving certain patterns. Like, <clears throat> um, I mean, I think there are people who are able to um, do radically different things and do them all with great uh, elan. But, um, but I kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of interested in the idea of, of yeah, of, of gradually kind of mutating a, a particular theme in a way. And, and I think it's helpful for me in, in conceptualizing what the next thing is to try and feel like there is some continuum between the different projects. I mean, for myself, the fiction that I write definitely has something to do with the screenwriting that happens and also the writing I continue to do about art um, helps me kind of generate ideas that um, are relevant too. Um, like I don't wanna have to reinvent the wheel every time I start and I think that having that foundation just makes, a more, makes for a more sustainable practice. Yeah. Okay, vulnerability and authenticity in creative practice, happiness and, uh, um, uh, I think vulnerability, I say, is highly important. I mean, I do think that like, the only way that you're gonna get to people is by really giving something of yourself and revealing something, and I think that there is, um, I mean, to me, that's the amazing thing about fiction is it's a whole, um, it's a whole apparatus of sort of disguise and in direction that really allows you ultimately to deliver some of your most private thoughts and feelings. Um, I mean, by having sort of characters that are not yourself and scenarios that you've never found yourself in, it just opens this door to say things that you otherwise are not allowed to say. Authenticity, uh, I have no interest in at all. Um, I have, you know, I think to be obsessed with authenticity is to just give yourself a huge headache and like all of, you know, all these things that we enter into like demand some level of fraudulence and like I, I would much prefer to embrace like the fake and the, uh, and the fraudulent than the authentic because I don't, I, I, like to me it's just a source of, if you're trying to be authentic it, it becomes um, I just find that to be almost purely anxiety making because I don't know what that would be. <laughs> so yeah, yes and no. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so the critical theory stuff was for me, it was just so intoxicating as a young person. And there's some ways that I sort of resent that curriculum because, you know, rather than sitting there like copying out paragraphs of Foucault and Derrida, it would have been a lot better ultimately if I was copying out, you know, Melville and um, something like that. Um, but I can't deny that I was really drawn to it at the time, and for whatever reason, that was the stuff that kept me reading and kept me writing, and, and there was a kind of a political framework to it that was, that was important to me. Um, I have found that the, the actual diction of that writing and the actual, um, just the actual syntax and flow is, is extremely unhelpful as far as writing fiction goes. I mean, it's just academic writing is, is so wholly different than imagining things. Um, but I will say that some of the, some of the like, uh, political insights and some of the, um, uh, uh, you know, social and cultural interests that circulate in that kind of writing has been helpful in locating what might be interesting subjects to write about. Um, you know, uh, I mean, just the fact of like, oh, I'm going to write a book that involves like, um, yeah, young filmmakers, like partly that's coming from just an interest in like, just knowing that there are lots of ideas about media that could be interesting to get at in that milieu. Um, so I think as a, yeah, as a kind of framework, or, or as a kind of siphon, I guess, to, to, to subject matter, I find it helpful, but as actual template, it's very bad. Yeah. Um, no, no, I think not. I mean, I think that there are like, I mean, to me, like, the actual making, the actual use of the imagination is not a critical faculty. It's like there's something else that goes on with that. And like, um, it is, uh, yeah, there's to, to kind of, yeah, it's just, it's a, it, I, I think it's, it's not helpful. There's an, an intuitive quality to, to writing in a fictive mode that is, yeah, it's, it's very different than analyzing something. And it's, I mean, there is a sort of a mysticism to it that is like boring to talk about because it's like talking about your dreams or something, but it is, um, but it does exist, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So this is perhaps a tough, um, tough question, but what do you think the next thing that you're going to give up? The next thing I'm going to give up? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think I'm giving up uh, Portland in some ways. Um, a lot of my writing uh, has been very much grounded in this land around here, like the writing I've done has all taken place in the Northwest and has um, been really interested in, like, yeah, just the, the culture of the Northwest, the um, mythologies of the Northwest, the, um, um, the, ideas that, uh, the ideas and the feelings of the landscape. And I really feel like that, I've kind of gone as far as I want to go with that at the moment. And um, partly it's less interesting just as Portland in the Northwest has become more well known to the rest of the world, it's less, it feels like, all right, plenty of other people are like digging in that realm. Um, so for me, it's definitely, it, it has to do with, uh, there's a, a landscape shift that I'm trying to enact in my mind. Yeah. How did you support yourself and your creativity during those early years? Uh, let's see, in those early years in the 20s, how the fuck did I make the <laughs> bills? <laughs> uh, I was a janitor at uh, Cinema 21, um, that was cool, that gave you free movies all over town. Uh, I collected unemployment, like a European. <coughs> um, I, uh, um, oh man, I was a horrible worker. Uh, I did, uh, I was a secretary at, uh, for a while. I was like, yeah, I typed stuff for people. I worked at a bookstore. It was all, you know, very piecemeal stuff. Um, and, um, and yeah, and I mean, 
way sub poverty level. I mean, it was very not uh, whatever, but it was fine. No big deal. Yeah, <laughs> lived lived with a lot of other people. Um, so yeah, I barely supported myself. I guess is the answer. Yeah. Currently, I am, um, most of my time right now is going into a new novel that is, I think I can safely say is underway now and is like happening. Um, there are also a couple movie projects that uh, my work is largely done on. Um, there's a script I wrote with uh, Kelly Reichert who's made a few, who I mentioned before, and uh, that just finished shooting, um, that's like a, eco-terrorist sort of noir movie about people blowing up a dam. <clears throat> and so that's in editing right now. And um, then there's a script uh, with Todd Haynes, who I uh, worked with on um, uh, Mildred Pierce, which is a HBO miniseries. And this is, a, uh, I think that script is also done, but is now moving into the next casting phase. And hopefully we'll find some insanely famous person who wants to um, bankroll the whole thing. <laughs> um, but he has good luck with that, so hopefully that will happen. So yeah, that's the main work right now. Yeah. Uh, thanks, it was awesome to hear you. <laughs> thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That solitary time of actually just making something. Totally. Um, and I'm wondering, it's very interesting to me just to know how people actually work. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you can talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's gotten a little harder with kids. Like, I've had to, like, change some of my hours of work. Um, I'll say I was very lucky, in a sense, um, to have a dad uh, who, um, uh, was a Buddhist and would often uh, sit in the morning uh, quietly doing his meditation practice um, and who also was often unemployed. Um, and uh, I was sort of had the model of a sedentary kind of adulthood uh, from the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so to me it seems normal to just sit in your house in a room <laughs> not doing anything, <laughs> you know? Um, um, and uh, because I think you're right, I mean, I think the sitting still and being by yourself is a, it's a, it's a huge struggle for a lot of people, and, and uh, it's, um, and it's where it becomes real work, you know? I mean, that's where it's, you know, not as fun all the time, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know, it's what you have to do, I don't know. I mean, I think also, yeah, you have to somehow find a way to cultivate those, like, large periods of inactivity, you know, at least for writing fiction. I mean, it's funny, if someone had a camera on me or any other fiction writer, um, the work of it would look utterly ludicrous, you know? I mean, it's just like, here he is sitting and looking at the <laughs> ceiling again, like, you know, he's making another sandwich, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but, like... But that kind of, but that is work, you know? I mean, it's hard to explain to someone, but that is actually, there are things going on as you're, as you're not doing things that are, um, that are crucial. So yeah, giving up and don't do anything. Those are my, those are my like, uh, main lessons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks all for coming.